And so um, if you have been in Christian circles for, in, for enough time, you may have heard someone say this or you have heard someone um, you know, write this or, or, or share this. Right? The very simple statement, right? prayer works. Prayer works. I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard someone say that at some point to you, right? Prayer works. But in fact, as, uh, as I've uh, kind of gotten older, um, I've become more hesitant myself personally to use that phrase, prayer works, um, because if you really think about it, what does someone mean when they say prayer works? Because I feel that what they mean by that is that they got their prayer answered, Right? That's what they mean when they say prayer works, is that God gave me the answer that I was looking for when I prayed. So, in other words, they asked something of God, and then they prayed, and, as a re- and the result was God gave them what they asked. So whether that's um, something you know, simple, passing a test, or to something may- maybe more like miraculous, the healing of a sick loved one, or maybe even something trivial, praying for a new iPhone, right? that God did it. And so, because you prayed and you got it, prayer works. But what I want to emphasize as we start our series, and this is part of where I want to shift our mindset, is that that actually is not what prayer is. That prayer isn't about asking God to grant whatever wish list we have, even however noble and selfless it may be, but yet that is not prayer, asking God to grant our wish list, or simply asking or telling God what we want. That's not what prayer is. But when we see prayer in this way, what happens then is that God simply becomes a means to an end. He becomes a means to an end in that God is the means, he's the way that we are trying to use in order to achieve what it is that we're ultimately looking for. Right? When we see prayer as this way, prayer works attitude, we're looking at God as a way to get what it is that we're ultimately trying to seek. Again, regardless of how selfless or how noble it may be. And that often leaves us disillusioned or frustrated or angry when we pray. Because what happens? Well, again, when we don't get what we prayed for, then what's the point? Why? Why pray? But then again, is that really what prayer is? Well, um, a very simple definition. Um, If you were to just look this up in a a theological uh, dictionary, for example, um, a very simple uh, definition of prayer. Prayer is, uh, as it says, the addressing or petitioning of God. Or in other words, maybe a more simple way to say this is it's communicating with God. It's a relationship. It's building a deeper knowledge, a deeper intimacy with the one who created us. And as such, if this is the case, if prayer isn't just a means to an end, to petition God to get what we want. And if it is communication, if it is relationship, then as such, the main purpose of prayer is, in fact, transformative, not transactional. A transactional meaning, you know, you're doing it, you, uh, maybe you will read your Bible, you'll be good, you'll obey God, you'll pray to him in hopes that if you keep your end of the bargain, he kind of keeps his end of the uh, bargain by answering your prayer. But that's not what prayer is, right? Prayer, the main purpose of prayer is transformative, not transactional. It's transformative in that when you pray, it changes us. It reorients your perspective. See, what Jesus was pointing out to his disciples regarding prayer was the disciples' proper relationship to God the Father. He was trying to teach them to pray this way so that it aligns how they see things with the reality of who God is and how he's working, how he's working around them, through them, and in them. But that was what Jesus was teaching as he taught them to pray, right, to uh, the proper relationship to God the Father. 
And so, again, Luke, in, in our passage, Luke chapter 11, it's a very familiar teaching on what it is we all know is the Lord's Prayer. And uh, this one in Luke, if it sounds a little bit strange to you, because it's, uh, it's a parallel passage, and so the parallel passage is from Matthew chapter 6. And so you're probably maybe more familiar with that one, because this version in Luke is a little bit more condensed. Um, but at this point in Luke, this is actually, so I showed you the slides at the beginning of all the references to prayer. So this point in chapter 11 is the fifth time that Luke referred to Jesus praying. And it's also, in fact, the only time that Luke records someone asking Jesus to teach them something. So that's the only time that that happens, that the disciples come to Jesus and ask him, Jesus, teach us to pray. So that also shows us, um, in, it indicates for us the importance of what's being taught. And as one commentary notes, you know, because of the variance that we see between Matthew's account of this and Luke's account of what Jesus was teaching on prayer, it could be that Jesus had given similar teaching on separate occasions. And so, uh, in, in other words, uh, Matthew's account and Luke's account wasn't actually the same uh, instance that Jesus was teaching. It could be that. However, it could also be that Jesus gave... Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the teaching, not as, um, a, uh, not as a, okay, you have to say this prayer word for word, but more as a model for us, a template for us, right? To show the importance of praying, but not, you know, pray these words specifically, but this is the way that you should pray. And so he begins, verse 2, by saying, okay, pray this way, right? This is how you should pray. Father, verse 2. And the term here, again, is a reminder for us both as an intimate, and it's it's both an intimate and respectful title. And by using it, the disciples were expressing the relationship that they enjoyed with God because of their relationship with Jesus. And for us today, it's still that reminder of that intimacy and love that we have and our personal relationship with God as well. 